What's the strongest beat in a 4-4 bar? Well, that's pretty easy, right? It's the downbeat. And how about the second strongest beat? Well, again, I think most people would agree that it's beat 3. But what if you have something more complicated, like this inner 8th note in a 9-8 bar, or this offbeat 16th note? Can you quantify how important each of these beats is relative to all the other beats in the bar? What I'd like to talk about in this video is a concept invented by my former teacher, Clarence Barlow, that tries to do just that. Clarence called this concept indispensability, one of a number of different itty terms that he used to quantify various aspects of music theory. Clarence passed away recently, and so this video is kind of a tribute to him and to his novel ways of thinking about music. I hope you find his ideas as inspiring as I have. Okay, so returning to the 4-4 bar, let's consider every 8th note subdivision of the bar and see if we can put them in order of their strength within the meter. After the downbeat and the third beat, it's natural then to do beats 2 and 4 before moving on to the offbeats. Clarence, and I think most people, would consider beat 4 to be the stronger of the pair, followed by beat 2. The reason for this is that beat 4 leads into the downbeat, whereas beat 2 is a kind of echo of the downbeat, or alternatively, a pickup to the weaker beat 3. Now for offbeats, we can take a similar approach and think about what larger beats they serve as pickups to. Following this reasoning, the AND of 4 is the most important because it leads into the downbeat, followed by the AND of 2 because it leads into beat 3, then the AND of 3, and finally the AND of 1. Now that we've placed all of these beats in order, Clarence would number them from 0 to 7, with 7 being the most important and 0 being the least important. And to experience this numbering in action, we can start with a full measure of 8th notes and then gradually remove the least important beats until only the downbeat remains, a process Clarence called dilution. Let's take a listen. Now before we take a look at more complicated time signatures and metric structures, it'll be helpful to take a different view of the same example, looking at the subdivisions of 4-4 as a tree. See, meter is hierarchical, and there's a sense in which 4-4 is a 2 by 2 by 2 meter. By this I mean that the whole note duration of the measure breaks naturally into two half notes, each of which in turn breaks into two quarter notes, each of which in turn breaks into two eighth notes. For visualizing indispensability, it's actually going to be helpful to reframe this tree so that it works backwards, emphasizing the way in which certain beats serve as pickups or lead-ins to other beats. So let's start with a stream of eighth notes in 4-4 time, and then instead of looking at a measure starting on the downbeat, look at a measure's worth of eighth notes leading into the downbeat. We then construct a tree by first considering the downbeat and its half-bar pickup, then considering the quarter note pickups to each of those moments, and then finally considering the 8th note pickups to each of those moments. Having constructed this tree, we can work from the strongest or most indispensable beat to the weakest or most dispensable beat by doing a kind of binary counting, treating the upper levels as the least significant bits and the lower levels as the most significant bits. Pretty cool, huh? Okay, enough with 4-4 time, let's look at a compound meter, for example 6-8. The wrinkle here is that now it's not just a binary tree, because while the dotted half note breaks into two dotted quarter notes, each dotted quarter note breaks into three eighth notes, which then break into two sixteenths. So this is a 2 by 3 by 2 meter. According to his formulation of indispensability, whenever there was a subdivision of 3 at some point in the metric hierarchy, Clarence treated the first as the most important, followed by the last because it leads into the first, followed finally by the middle subdivision, which is a kind of pickup to the pickup. So with that in mind, let's try to order the beats of 6-8 time by importance. As before, the downbeat is clearly the most important, followed by the halfway point. We then pick the eighth note upbeats immediately preceding the downbeat and halfway point. Finally, we fill in the remaining cracks, first the fourth eighth note, and then the second eighth note, which serve as upbeats to the upbeats. If we want to keep going with the offbeat 16th notes, just as with the offbeats in 4-4, we order them based on the strength of the beat that they lead into. Just like with the 4-4 case, it's particularly elegant to watch this process unfold within the backwards tree structure. As before, there's a kind of counting going on, but for the layers that subdivide into 3, we count one higher than the layers that subdivide into 2. It's kind of like counting in some mixture between base 2 and base 3. Finally, having visualized this a couple of different ways, let's assign numbers based on the order of indispensability, 
and take a listen as a full stream of 16th notes thins out gradually, according to the indispensability measurement. As one final example, Clarence often like to point out the difference between 3-4 and 6-8 when analyzed according to indispensability, since both time signatures contain the same number of eighth notes, grouped in different ways. In this diagram from his book On Music Quantics, he goes a step further and compares the 16th note subdivisions for 3-4, 6-8, and 12-16 according to indispensability. 3-4 is a 3 by 2 by 2 meter, 6-8 is a 2 by 3 by 2 meter, and 12.16 is a 2 by 2 by 3 meter. As an exercise, I encourage you to try deriving these values for yourselves, and perhaps drawing the different tree structures for each meter. Okay, so we've seen a number of examples now, but how generally can we apply this concept of indispensability? Well, first of all, the beauty of all this is that it can apply to any kind of nested metric structure, and that it can extend both down to very small subdivisions and up into the hypermeter. But if we really want to generalize it, there are a couple of wrinkles to handle. For example, how do you deal with subdivisions of larger primes, like 5 or 7? Clarence's answer was to always treat it as a series of groups of 2, followed by a group of 3. In my own experiments, I've made this a bit more flexible, even extending indispensability to work with arbitrary additive meters. The main limitation I see with indispensability is that it assumes an isochronous grid, meaning a smallest perfectly even subdivision. So we won't be able to apply it to micro-timing variations, or uneven or irrational grids. Still, after all of this, the real question is, how can we use this musically? Well, I actually included a module for calculating indispensability in SCAMP extensions, part of SCAMP, my suite for computer-assisted music in Python. The relevant function here is called indispensability array from expression, and it takes a description of the metric hierarchy, in this case a nested additive meter, and when you run it, it returns a list of all the different indispensability values for that metric structure. In this script, I've created a percussion part and assigned different percussion instruments to play for different ranges of indispensability. So the kick is on the highest indispensabilities, the ride bell is on the mid to high indispensabilities, the tambourine plays on all except the high indispensabilities, and the cowbell plays somewhere in the middle. Let's take a listen to this. One two one two three one two one two one two three one two one two one two three one two. In that example, the additive layer two plus three plus two was in the middle of the metric hierarchy. If I were to switch these layers, you would hear the additive aspect of it operating at the top of the metric hierarchy. Let's take a listen to that. One, two. One, two, three, one, two. Now this is a pretty simple example, but it does give you some sense of the value of indispensability, because certain types of instruments tend to play on more or less important subdivisions within the measure. By the way, I used indispensability in a different way to create the background music for this video. Check out my Patreon for a short video explaining how that worked. My most musical use of indispensability, though, was in my piece Barlicity which I wrote a few years ago as a tribute to Clarence and all of his wacky ideas. In Barlicity, I used indispensability to determine the beats on which the piano should play, as well as the pitches that it should play on those beats. When you try to use indispensability in this way, though, sometimes the result is kind of square. So to counteract this, I randomly inverted the indispensability sometimes to create syncopation. Another way I used indispensability in this piece was in the electronic part, where the importance of different beats determined where runs of notes started and stopped. Indispensability was one of several ideas of Clarence's that I used in Barlicity. 
I also used some of his ideas about pitch organization. For example, the use of multidimensional scaling to map out the harmonic relationships between different pitches within a pitch collection. I hope to make some videos about these ideas as well in the future. Anyway, I'll put a link to Barlicity in the video description, and along with it I'll put some of Clarence's music, because if you haven't heard any of it, it's pretty wild. Clarence had a fascinating musical mind, and both his music and his personality were suffused with a sense of humor and good nature. He leaves a legacy of musical inspiration to all of his former students and colleagues, and I hope you've had a glimpse of that here. We miss you, Clarence.